Welcome to the number one source for information, news, and opinion on your Columbus Blue Jackets. This is CBJ in 30, presented by Telhio Credit Union. You can also find the audio version on the CBJ Radio SoundCloud page, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Now here's your host, Bob McGilligan. Welcome to CBJ and 30 presented by Telhio Credit Union. The Blue Jackets coming off a shutout win last night of the Nashville Predators. Three to nothing was the final score. Sure feels a world better than it felt on Monday in Carolina when the Blue Jackets gave up seven goals to the Hurricanes, doesn't it? Talk about that more in just a second. Right now, I want to talk to you about Telhio Credit Union. You know, they started putting people above profits way back in 1934. So it is simply just what they do. It's in their DNA. They want to make sure that you are getting the best treatment and that you have your money in the right place. So do you? That's a question you need to ask. The answers you can find by going to tellhio.org. Just surf through their website, click on the different tabs, find out what they offer, what bonuses and perks they have to what they offer, and you might find out that they are the place for you. The question, why settle for a regular bank? when you can go with a credit union that puts you ahead of everything else. Telhio Credit Union. Find them on the web at telhio.org. So the Blue Jackets with that big win last night over the Nashville Predators, taking the first game of the two-game series. Cam Atkinson getting a goal, his fifth straight game with a goal. That has him uh, two off his own pace. He's tied for the franchise record for uh, consecutive games with a goal at seven. So he's at five right now. It was a fluky goal, but hey, the fluky goals count too, right? Matt Benning, the defenseman, trying to slide and stop the shot. The shot goes off of his skate, pops up in the air, and floats over the head of UC Soros. The goaltender of the Nashville Predators drops in the back of the net, and that's how the Blue Jackets get on the board with just under 17 seconds remaining in the first period of the game. And then Max Domi made it a 2 to nothing game in the second period, although that was not without controversy as the referees went to the Situation Room in Toronto to see if the linesman had been hit by the puck because had he, uh, had it been determined, I should say, that the puck went off of him, then they would have said that it was no goal because there is a rule, and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't really aware of that rule. There is a rule that if the puck def- deflects uh, directly off an official and goes into the net, that the goal does not count. So they reviewed it. And they determined it did not hit off of him before going in the goal. So that goal stood. And then, of course, Eric Robinson in the third period adds an empty netter to set the final score. Elvis Merzlikens got the shutout. And I've got to tell you, you know, Elvis all night, he made some good saves. And then I thought at times that he was fighting the puck a little bit. And sometimes you don't want to say that or you wonder, you wonder to yourself, is that fair to say when a guy got a shutout? And he made like, what, 32, 33 saves in it. So is it fair to say he was fighting the puck here and there or whatever? And then I saw his interview with Dave Metzold on Fox Sports Ohio after the game. And I got to tell you, I really gained more respect for Elvis Merzlikens in that interview because Dave started off congratulating him on the shutout. And the first thing he said was, I didn't handle the puck very well tonight. I gave up way too many rebounds. And I told my team, thank you very much. That is a team shutout. That is a very mature thing to say. And the thing about Elvis is I know that he means it. He knows, every player knows when they're on and when they're not completely on. Not every player will admit when they're not completely on. He went right to it and admitted that it wasn't my best, but the guys in front of me did a good job and there's a shutout that is put in place because of it. So uh, I give him a lot of credit for that. He then went on to say, that he still doesn't feel like himself from last year. He said, I'm still not the Elvis from last year. Now, he got hurt and he missed some time. Uh, He hasn't been able to to play in a regular rotation here. So he is trying to get his feet back under him, if you will. But uh, kudos to him. Again, just being honest. In today's world, it's hard to find complete honesty, right? But Elvis gave it. I didn't play very well. I haven't felt like myself, but lo and behold, we got to win. And that's all that matters. And that is all that matters for the Blue Jackets. At times, did the Predators look better than the Blue Jackets on the ice in that game? Yeah, they did. But it doesn't matter because they didn't win. And they're now a struggling franchise that is becoming a desperate franchise. 
because they are not gaining points and they're watching everybody else get points in this division. So it is just a big win for the Blue Jackets. However it comes, nobody cares. Did you win or did you lose? That's all people ask. They don't, they don't ask, how did you win? How did you lose? Did you win or did you lose? They won and they won by shutout. And I think it's a great point to start over for the Blue Jackets, right? Whatever that, and again, they had won in Chicago. They got three out of four in Chicago before they blew that game in Carolina. But that game in Carolina stunk so bad. This is a good place to go and say, all right, we rebounded nicely. Now we've got to do it again. And then we got to do it again. It's one of those wins. I'm not saying it's going to start a streak, but it's one of those types of games that gives you the potential to start some kind of a streak. So we'll see if they do. Second game against Nashville is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Nationwide Arena. And it'll be interesting because that game got chippy last night. Further along it went, the more chippy it got. And, you know, we've had this theory about playing back-to-back games and it creating animosity and maybe some physical play, maybe some dirty play. I think that question is going to be answered. The question being, is that really going to happen playing back-to-back games? Is is that really still the game? Are are the players still like that? Or are they just going to let everything go from game one and not worry about it in game two? I think the answer to that question comes tomorrow night because that game had enough grit and extra – slashes at the goalie and all that stuff in it uh, that it could make tomorrow night's game very interesting so i want to see i want the answer to that question and i think we're going to get the answer to that question tomorrow night well on today's show i decided to uh take you around the league a little bit we don't talk about the league enough because we're not playing the entire league we're only playing seven teams throughout the course of the entire season but did you know there are three other divisions that are playing There's one in the East, there's one in the West, there's one in Canada. They're all playing. And all of them have a team that is going to go to uh, the conference final or the semifinals, whatever you want to call it this year. It doesn't matter to me. They're all going to go there. So at some point, you hope to be there. The Blue Jackets hope to be there, and they're going to have to face one of these other teams. And by next year, we're going to see all these teams again. So let's take a, a little trip around the league today. And I wanted to bring in a heavy hitter to do that, somebody that is seeing games all throughout the league because he works for NBC and NBC Sportsnet. And uh, he's going to come on with me and talk about that and also about the new job that he got a couple of weeks ago as the television play-by-play voice for the expansion Seattle Kraken. I'm going to bring him in right now. Here is John Forslund. Well, before we talk about what's going on in the league, I want to talk about you and this new adventure that you're going to embark on next year because it was announced a couple of weeks ago that you are going to be, there it is, the uh, (laughs) television play-by-play voice of the Seattle Kraken, the first ever TV play-by-play voice of a team that's going to come into existence for next season. Um, I have an idea of what might have led to that, but tell tell me where the dots were connected and how you wound up in Seattle. Yeah, well, Bob, thanks for having me. Great to see you. Um, you know, I, I think the major dot most people have drawn um, A to B to is between me and Ron Francis, right? And right. so, yes, uh, Ronnie obviously is a, a good friend of mine, and and you know he was watching my situation go down a bad road in Carolina, and the first phone call I got on July first was from Ron asking me how I was and how my family was and kind of being sympathetic to what he went through, what I went through and kind of that frustration. At the end of the conversation, he said, I want to put you in touch with Todd Lywicki, who's the CEO of the Kraken and just open up a conversation. I'm sure you're going to have some options, which is very nice of him to say. And that's what everybody does when you go through something like that. And I appreciate it. But when you're that person, you don't really know that's going to be true. Certainly in our business, it's not a given, right? So he turned me on to Todd and we had a talk for maybe four months back and forth about different things. And then in and around the holidays, uh, this situation became more real. 
and they presented me with an offer and it was an offer that, you know, the old saying, you couldn't refuse. So I couldn't refuse this offer. I waited against what I was already doing. I did talk to NBC about it. Um, I have the ability to do national work with my new deal. The Kraken uh, have their arms open to that idea. So uh, if that's the case moving forward and we don't know where the right going as of yet, if whether it be NBC or an ESPN or a Fox or a combination of two or three, uh, we'll see where it is. If I can be involved in national landscape, uh, terrific. And if not, my prime focus, as it always had been for years, is to be with a team. And I love being with a team. And I consider myself really lucky to do this twice from day one, uh, to get an opportunity to start marking history and what we do uh, from the first day of a franchise and what looks like a remarkable situation in Seattle. Yeah, you were in Hartford, and then, of course, Hartford moved to Raleigh and became the Carolina Hurricanes. So, as you said, you went through that. You got into a new market where yeah. uh, it, it wasn't an expansion team, but it was brand new to North Carolina, and you were introducing it there. So, um, what kind of experiences do you think that you can draw upon from that transition that will help you going into the Seattle transition? Well, I, I think there's a lot there. That's a good question. I think, I think there's, there's a lot there. The world's changed significantly in terms of media, social media, uh, the different platforms that, that are in place to market a team, enhance a team's brand. We didn't have that in 1997. As you know, it was a relocation. It was a four month transition from closing the doors in Hartford and moving here. And then the team had to play out of market in Greensboro for two years before they opened the building in Raleigh. And that was unique and crazy and borderline clown show. So, I mean, you know, it, this is way different that way. This is a, a, an expansion buildup in a new era, a major sports city, major league franchise, deep ownership, uh, unbelievable season ticket base, unbelievable waiting lists, state-of-the-art facility, state-of-the-art practice facility, all I have to do is go in there and do my job. And there's a bunch of great people surrounding me as evidenced by that rollout where I was, uh, you know, I was a little taken back by that. That was a lot of attention I didn't really need, but they, they really built it up. You know what I mean? So I, I, we didn't have those, those things working for us back then. Now, when it comes to breaking ground and doing television and, and broadcasting for the franchise, it's going to be the same. And I think I can reach back to my um, experience and, and look at what we did here, because I'm very proud of what happened here. I mean, we came to virgin territory and, and, and did the best we could. And I, and I think we did a really good job here over 23 years to um, you know, foster the growth of the team, build an identity of a fan known now in the last few years, the bunch of jerks and all these different things that have led to the identity of the Hurricanes, who are a very good, as you know. So, I mean, the same thing will happen, I think, in Seattle. Uh, here, you had to get into a landscape of college basketball, college football, and a little bit of NASCAR. And you had a bunch of people here who had no idea why we were here. That's not the case in Seattle. Seattle has some hockey history. They've had junior hockey there for a long time. They've had some pro history in their background. But there also is the the Seahawks identity with their fans, the Sounders, the Mariners, and, and what used to be the Supersonics. There, there is a rich history. And now the Kraken's uh, opportunity and goal is to get grab a niche of that, which will be difficult because you're still brand new. So you have to earn the trust of your fans as you go along. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, you brought up that Greensboro situation when you first went to North Carolina. A couple of weeks ago, I had your old broadcast partner, Trip Tracy, on, and he talked about those days where you would have to go to Greensboro for a morning skate and then spend the entire day there waiting for the game to yeah. begin. And yeah. uh, so, so this situation, a heck of a lot easier from that standpoint, right? Oh yeah. I hope so. <laughs> unless, I, unless I'm getting into something I, I really don't know that you couldn't, uh, it, it, I, we could do a, a, a podcast for hours on this subject. If people are actually interested as to some of the stories and some of the things that happen in the, anecdotal experiences between myself trip and chuck caton i mean just uh just phenomenal because we we're voyeurs on the whole thing and then we we're directly involved in the whole thing and uh over time like a good fish story you know these things stretch out and they get slightly exaggerated but you didn't have to under these circumstances you really did you really didn't have to it was um it was remarkable that this thing actually worked to be honest with you oh that's that's funny that's uh yeah he told me 
he told me some funny things and i'm sure as you said we could talk for a long long time yeah. about that um you know uh seattle when you talk to ron francis and i don't know if you've had this conversation or not but i've got to wonder you know vegas comes in a couple of years ago and they are so successful they wind up in the stanley cup final in their very first year which is now set a new standard for expansion right. teams uh fair or unfair probably unfair but you know, now, you know, they haven't had the expansion draft yet. That's going to come up in a couple of months here. Um, have you talked to him about that situation? And it, is there pressure to to uh, do what the Vegas Golden Knights did? Or is that just uh, one of those situations that's going to be once in a lifetime thing? I think the people he answers to believe that. I, I think they're they're like, hey, hey, we can do this. We can, right? Let's start printing the tickets to the Stanley Cup final in year one. Boy, that's a, that's a lot of expectation. That's a lot of pressure. Um, I have not talked to him about that. Um, he's alluded to it a couple of times. Um, I think the league is going to smarten up a little bit. I think they're going to be apprehensive of, you know, George McPhee is a genius and he, he did a remarkable job in and around the drafting of players, but also the trades he made so that teams could protect other guys. I'll be, to see how that all works um, but I, what I do know is this that by and large what you see today with the Carolina Hurricanes is because of Ron Francis no matter how people want to work the narrative however they want to say well you know under this new ownership these things have happened that is true and the new ownership has done a lot of really good things um, for the guys on the ice um, in terms of you know he spent a lot of money on players they're right at the cap um, I don't know if they, they need to be based on the market, but that's his decision. But that they have really good players. But when you look at drafting and developing, going all the way back to 2014, when Ronnie started this thing, um, there were very few prospects in the system because Jim Rutherford had operated in the now and tried to get the team relevant to sell tickets for the NHL franchise and did a lot of that season-to-season -season adjusting we've seen with the Penguins recently. And so when Ron took over the team, there wasn't much there. And he said, we have to draft, we have to develop, and we have to be patient. And very similar to the way the Blue Jackets have handled things over the years. You, you stockpile prospects, you build up your minor league team, you have success like they did in Cleveland. Uh, the, the Hurricanes won the Calder Cup in 2019, the same year they went to the conference final. And a lot of those players are either still here or they're playing with other NHL teams. And Ronnie has his hands all over it. He'll do the same thing there. Knowing him, I think he's going to be methodical. And I think he's going to want to do it the right way first before taking the temptation of what could lead you down a bad path. If he has to sacrifice the first season in terms of making the playoffs or not to make sure that they are annually good, I knowing him, he's going to do that. That's what I think. Yeah, and again, that's the normal course. Uh, what happened in right. Vegas was, was just – ridiculous and crazy right. had they won the stanley cup could you imagine that it almost happened for crying out loud <laughs> that, 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 would, that would tarnish the cup in a way it yeah would. it would it would in a way talking with john forsland of uh, the seattle kraken and also of course of nbc sports nbc sports net um let's talk about uh, the you covering the league and of course not being with the hurricanes any longer your job primarily this year is just uh, covering the league. So you're seeing a lot of teams. Heck, you're seeing a lot more teams than I'm seeing. We're only seeing seven teams throughout the course of the entire year. And I don't know how it feels for you. Does it feel normal? Because to me, it's almost like if I turn on the highlights and I see the Penguins and Flyers or the Capitals and Rangers, I'm like, like part of you is like, oh, yeah, there are other teams in this league. You, you almost forget. It's so weird when you're seeing the same teams over and over and over again. Yeah, if I were in your shoes – I would feel that way. You'd have to be laser focused on your division. It's almost like four leagues within one, right? They're four separate leagues. What's happening, that's not the case in terms of what's happening uh, with me because I have to, you know, all, if, I might, if I'm doing a, an Eastern-centric schedule, all of a sudden they drop me a Colorado-Vegas game, I better be ready to go. So, yeah, I got my eye on the entire league, including the Canadian division, because at some point, you know, I expect to be involved in the semifinals. We can't call them conference finals anymore, the semifinals. Um, and I'll have to, you know, pick up a Canadian team at that point. So you keep an eye on it as a broadcaster. It's been interesting to watch. Um, I've been intrigued by the Central Division in terms of how the, the parity has, has uh, 
kind of uh, grown organically in a, in, a, in a division, to be honest. I thought there were two, three good teams, and then there were going to be these other teams that would scramble for positioning. But right now, everybody's in there. The, the, every team has dealt with uh, postponements and COVID and, you know, all these different things. But it looks like, you know, getting down to game 56 in the Central Division, um, it, it could be a, a dogfight for the top four spots, never mind just who makes, you know, number four and say gets the right to play Tampa. I don't think that's the case because the Lightning are not a lock to win it. And the four teams that make the playoffs in the Central Division, you can't really earmark them all yet until somebody falls off the map. Yeah. And I mean, a team like Chicago has come out and uh, yeah. exceeded expectation, right? Everybody thought, well, they have no goaltending. They're rebuilding. Jonathan Tays isn't playing. And lo and behold, here they are, a bunch of young kids just trying to make a mark and playing hard, which, you know, it still works in this league, John. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the beauty of hockey, right? The beauty of our sport is that if you work hard, do the right things on the ice, pay attention to the coach, adhere to the system, you're going to you're going to compete. And and it's not a, a sport that's driven through two or three superstars on each team. Um, uh, you know, in basketball, you can do that. In basketball, it's been proven. You can add three superstars, your group of five, drive the team through those guys, drive the plays through those guys, and they're going to turn your franchise around. You can add a superstar to your lineup. Look at the Edmonton Oilers. They have two of the best players in the world, and uh, th they're going to scramble to make the playoffs. They're not, they're not not anybody dead right now uh, because they can't keep the puck out of the net. They don't have a deep defense and you know, they're trying to play a system. And, and the thing is in, in hockey, you have to do that. And that's, that's why, you know, as, as, as trite as it sounds, it, it's important for every player to have a role because that role accomplishes the goal. And, and that's what we see. And that's why I think it's a, a terrific game, which leads us to the best playoffs of any sport. There's no question. Now, when you talk about adding superstars, I want to ask you, the Blue Jackets did add a superstar in Patrick Line a couple of weeks ago, and the Blue Jackets were the talk of the league there for a few weeks uh, with the Pierre-Luc Dubois situation and then finally making that trade with Winnipeg. As a guy that is covering the game nationally right now, uh, what was the talk in the national circles? What, what did you guys think when you get together to do games? And I'm sure you talked about this situation. What was the talk about what was going on here and, and ultimately, what resulted out of it? Well, in Pierre's case, it was a state of confusion, right? No one could understand how, you know, he went to this bridge deal. It looked like he was going to put down roots in Columbus. You know, there were stories that he bought a place and everything, and how everything was going to be, you know, great moving forward. And his wage was fair on a bridge deal to lead him to a bigger deal. And then any of us who had covered the Blue Jackets nationally had, had seen how important of a player he is in the second season. I got impressed with his playoff performances but then there's that breakdown and I had the last game I, I we did the last game nationally against Tampa Bay where he didn't play and uh, you know the next day there was all kinds of speculation which led to the departure and then I think the natural thing Bobby to talk about amongst all of us is you know is there a rift with torts because torts is always a lightning rod and as you know I have a utmost high level of respect for John Tortorella based on one-to-one -one interactions over the years. I don't get lost in what happens with him and others. I don't pay attention to that. I look at his record. I look at how he's improved players. I look at what past players have said about him after their careers are over. And then I look at how he has always treated me and he's always treated me with respect. So I am, I'm, a, I'm not one that automatically goes there. I think there's something going on with the player. And now what has happened here is it's very interesting. Two for one, very good player going to Winnipeg, no question. But now you get Jack Roslovic, who is excited to play in Columbus and should be, and that's a great story. And then you have Line. And Line has been the enigma. But I do know this. I know Paul Maurice very well from our days in Hartford, days in Carolina. And I know what he demands out of players. And there's something there that Torts has to get to with Line. And if he's successful, it'll really work. And if he's not, it's going to be some other coach's responsibility to draw this out of this player because he just has to complete his game. And I don't, he's, he's got a boatload of talent, obviously, and an unreal shot and a vital weapon on anybody's power play. But why, why is he here? Why is he in this position? What's going on? And I, and I think there's somebody who can make him better. It's John Tortorella. That's my hope. Uh, and, I, and I hope he does because he's a world-class talent. You know, and, and it's funny you say that because 
I, I was watching the game last night, and, and this is what I was thinking about Patrick Line. We, we get done with a game, and he has an assist, and he now has a four-game point streak. And I'm thinking to myself, where did he get that assist? Like, I, I didn't even really see this guy during this game tonight. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm not saying that he's not trying or, or anything like that. It's just that when Artemi Panarin was here, and we're always going to make that – that uh, comparison, John, because they're superstars, these two guys, right? right? But Artemi Panarin was always visible. I can, there might have been five games in his tenure here where I got done and I went, man, he didn't look like he was playing well. I think I had to ask Torts maybe two times in the two years, maybe one time in the two years, um, you know, is Panarin not going right now? He was always visible in, in what he was doing. And maybe it was because he's a smaller guy and he's always moving more quickly. Uh, Line is a big guy. He kind of looks like he's gliding around out there, e- even when he's skating hard. Um, it- it's just funny because, yeah, you say about towards getting something out of him. I'm watching him play and I'm thinking, what has he done anything? And then he does have the point at the end of the night. Uh, I don't know. I think you're right. I think there's so much untapped potential with that guy. And if he can tap into it, he's already a great player. I, he, he could right. be a legitimate superstar player. Yeah, absolutely. And and then I think what needs to happen, and again, this is an outsider's perspective on the situation. Unless you're there day to day, it's hard for anybody to get a gauge on what's really gone on with this player. But I would call him sleepy great. Okay, not sleepy good, sleepy great. So he, he plays the game sleepy. The thing is, you can probably do that as long as the sleepy great defensive plays and little details that many of us miss are noticed by the locker room and the coaching staff. So my point here, Bob, is that there will be a day, I, I would think, if it works out well, where if Torts is still running the show, Line is having success, there's going to be a team meeting. And Patrick Line is going to crank out a back check where he's going to get the puck out of the zone inside the blue line when he's supposed to. He's going to win a battle on the boards and they're going to string these three things together. And then they're going to string together his lightning shot, you know, off the, on the power play or a snipe in tight where he roofs it. You know, he shows off his ability that way to score. And they're going to say, here's a complete game. And then the rest of the team is going to say, yeah, he, he's, he's on board with the concept. You know, um, we've talked about it in the past. You and I have about the identity of the Blue Jackets. That's been accomplished. That's hard to get culture in the NHL it's hard to get there and I think what Torts is doing right now is saying we're not gonna let anybody break what's going on here we've survived Bobrovsky we've survived Panarin we've survived these other things massive injuries and now it's Dubois and he's gone and now we've got these two guys well they're gonna come here and join the party or not and that's gonna be the thing and uh, at his age with his talent that's untapped I, I don't think I don't think it's going to be that hard. I think he's going to get it. And I think he's going to become like Steve Eiserman did many years ago, a better player because they finally got to that that groundbreaking situation where Scotty Bowman told Eiserman, listen, you can get 135 points every year and we'll lose or you can get 85 to 90 points and we'll win a cup. What do you want to do? <laughs> and Eiserman did it right Yep. And, uh, you know, this guy's a winger. He's not a center. It's a little bit different, but the mindset is the same. Just get him to adapt. And I know that Paul went through that with him in Winnipeg, you know, a 50 goal score trading when the 50 goal score is a problem or, and not, not really a locker room problem, but a, but a style of play problem. I think that's where he has to figure out his game. So as you are, are watching all these other teams in the league, and again, since, as you said, I'm laser focused on what's going on in the central division here, uh, what are you seeing around the league? Uh, who who are the best teams right now? Uh, Vegas. I, I think Vegas is, is uh, it's pretty close. Colorado hasn't played enough and they've had injuries. They had a massive COVID problem for almost two weeks. Um, but right now I'd say the teams I've seen from, from afar, from a padded room in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, Vegas Golden Knights have done two of their games. Very impressive. And the Canadian division, um, I'm surprised at a couple of things. I'm surprised at how well the Leafs are playing because they are playing great and how poorly Vancouver has played. I I thought Vancouver was going to be better than this and they haven't been. Montreal, I thought they'd be a turnaround story. They have been Uh, in the central division. I mean, obviously we talked about the Blackhawks. Uh, That's that's an amazing story because after game one, Eddie Olchek, Brian Boucher and myself walked out of Amelie Arena in Tampa after a 5-1 game and looked at each other and said, are they going to compete? 
Is it possible? And I think that was a fair question based on the goaltending that was completely unproven. This Kevin Lankin has come out of nowhere and, and the style of play. And Jeremy Colton's done a really good job getting them to play a team game. So let's see if they can keep that going in the East division, but it's a, it's, it's Boston and the great start. Uh, but I think my team there is Philadelphia. And again, they've been hit hard and still are with COVID. They're going to Lake Tahoe with seven of the regulars out of the lineup. Um, I really like them. I, I, I would did a lot of their games in the, in the, in the bubble and uh, was able to uh, appreciate, you know, what they have in terms of young talent coaching the goaltender i think is fantastic so but the, but that eastern division is is really uh like a lot of these things parity laden and and anything's possible you got washington pittsburgh uh the rangers are a disappointment i mean they're just not they're not going to be able to do it simple as that and the devils they're sneaky good but not for this year you know i think the devils are building something you know for the future they're playing hard with speed they won a big game last night in boston you know, they're, they're, they're better than people think they are. I want to ask you about Pittsburgh for a couple of reasons. Number one, you mentioned Jim Rutherford earlier and how he's a win now guy and he will trade the future so that he can win. And, you know, that made a lot of sense there with Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin and Chris Letang getting older. You're trying to keep that window open. You're trying to compete for a cup every year, but now that he's out of the picture there, uh, Ron Hextall, you just talked about the flyers and, and the young talent that they have. He's responsible for a lot of that. Um, you know, maybe for some reason he wound, he wound up out of there because he was too patient with bringing players along. But now he winds up in Pittsburgh as a general manager. And the big surprise in that situation, at least to me, I don't know if you saw it, but Brian Burke going in as the uh, president of hockey operations there, uh, that's quite a one-two punch at the top of your management uh, list there, isn't it? It really is. Um, I was shocked to see Berkey get back involved again. Um, I'm happy for him. I, I worked for him. And uh, it was a short period of time, but I really enjoyed working for him and we remain, you know, friendly to this day. So uh, good for him on that. Hextall, you're right. Um, in his uh, early years with Los Angeles, they were in Dean Lombardi. That was the, that was the plan. You go back to the 08 draft when they got Dowdy and then Kopitar after that and so on. And all these different guys, even a guy like Trevor Lewis, you know, they were able, Jonathan Quick, they're able to put this core together over time uh, with patience, and then you have two Stanley Cups. He goes to Philadelphia. That's his team right now. You know, the Flyers are Ron Hextall's team. He drafted the majority of those kids, and uh, they didn't want to be patient. You know, it's, Philadelphia is a tough market, as you know, uh, very fickle, and that's hard when your fans are fickle, they're paying the freight, the sponsors are fickle, the management can be, if, if everyone's not on the same page, it, it's going to fracture. Um, and so when, when you look at, at, at what they do now with Pittsburgh, now they've said, we want to win now, right? I think part of that's true, but I, I do know from talking to people smarter than I in terms of, of player uh, procurement and, and, and development and the scouts and so on, they tell me Pittsburgh doesn't have much, okay? I don't really know that, but they tell me that. So if you don't really have much, what do you do? If you're not going to be real, and, and really line up and, and be able to win a cup. Being close doesn't count because any team can go on a run and get it done, right? But if you're not, you have to do something with a guy like maybe Malkin. They've tried to, the reports are they've tried to trade Latang. I don't know if his market value is that great. I think it's good. I don't know if it's excellent. But Malkin at this stage, do you continue with this 87 71? I, I think there's a chance that 87 finishes as a penguin. That's it, that's done. I don't know if Malkin does. And Malkin's had, I think he should have been a top 100 player and was not when they did that in 17. Um, I, I think they might look at that because that's a way to make a huge deal. That's a way to make a huge deal and prove somebody that wants to win a cup and they will with Malkin and get a few more years out of them. And the Pittsburgh Penguins could set up their future. They could get a prime defenseman, a prime forward, a draft choice, and really start this process again to get them back. And then, and then let Sid finish and then retire his number. And, and, you know, and then maybe the team is still good. Now, what you don't want to have happen is all these guys run out of gas at the same time. And then you're, you're, you got an alumni team on your hands. That's not, I think that's what they have to figure out. And even if they're saying now we're, we're in the now, 
I think that's the message they want to continue with their fans because of the pandemic. And, you know, we want to make sure we have fans in the fall and the people are engaged and they don't want to lose. They don't want to write a letter and say we're rebuilding. I'm not 100 percent sure that they are. But I, but I think they've got a piece there. They've got a major piece to make a major deal if they don't wait too long. Yeah, and that's really interesting, too, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I, I've always said, and, you know, you talked earlier about this isn't a league of superstars, but, you know, the teams that really compete, they've got more than one guy. You know, they've got a couple yeah. of guys, right? Yeah. Um, but on the same token, there have always been rumblings for years, true or false, I have no idea, that, you know, Malkin wants to be the man on a team. And he, he wants yeah. to be – and you're never going to be the man, of course, with Sidney Crosby there. And I do agree with you. And, you know, there's been speculation. I know that – Darren Drager was one of the people that said something about maybe Crosby finishing in another uniform. I, I think the respect that he has for Mario Lemieux and uh, the fact that Lemieux did it and Lemieux owns the team now, I, I can't see him ever going anywhere. I, I just think that's, uh, you know, and I come from the Pittsburgh area. I think that's just kind of a, a respect thing there, Johnny, where, you know, he, yeah. I think he would want to finish it that way. Do you? I do too. I, I, I think, and that is, there are very few players you can say that about because Wayne Gretzky was traded. So there's, there's very few guys, but in this situation, based on the fact there are, in my opinion, and you could, you can really weigh in on this. There are two guys responsible for saving the Penguins, Mario Lemieux first, and then Sidney Crosby. And, and you look at the building and the success and everything that's happened here in the consecutive sellouts and all of that stuff. It's under Sid's watch. And so as much as he's a great player and one of the greatest players to ever play in the NHL, he's also really huge in terms of franchise significance. Unfortunately, Evgeny Malkin has been in that shadow. And Evgeny Malkin, when he has stepped up like he did in 09, was the most dominant player in the playoffs that year, bar none. So he, was, he did better than Sid in that season. But that was that year. And then there were other years when Sydney's been had to carry the team and has exceptional player, Hall of Fame style player. There's no, there's no question about it, but you're right. You know, where's the breaking point? And I do agree with you. I think Sydney is a penguin and I think it's almost sacrilegious to, to think about moving him out of there. And there may be one or two guys like that. You know, I, I he might be the only one really when you, when you think about in today's game. I think Matthews could move somewhere else someday. I think McDavid could move somewhere else someday from where they're at right now. McKinnon could move on from where he is right now. But uh, Sydney's been there longer. But he, he and, o and even Ovechkin could move. If this thing with his contract doesn't play out the way he wants it, does it seem like he'll leave Washington? No. But I think there's a chance that could happen. With Crosby, I just don't get it because of – knowing him and knowing his makeup and, uh, and everything else that's attached. He's married to that thing. I think no question. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. And the only thing I will uh, take issue with is, well, you were correct when you said the two people that saved the franchise, but Mario actually saved it two times once as a player and once as an owner. <laughs> True. Okay. That's why I wanted you to weigh in. Cause you know, more, you, you know more about that than I do, but yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's a hundred percent. They needed a lot of help with that. Right. There's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, then no question about that. Um, so they're playing the games in Lake Tahoe this weekend. Uh, you mentioned that. Um, you know, some people say, and I don't agree with this. Some people say, why is the league doing this in the midst of this pandemic? And you got all this stuff going on. Why are they making such a spectacle out of going and playing? My feeling is you have a chance to do maybe a once in a lifetime thing with the league and try to gain some prestige and some more viewers. Why not go ahead and do it? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's all about a spectacle for the fans, something different for the fans. It's great the game's back, and it's great that the fans are watching these games, but the fans are missing some juice here. As you watch games repeatedly every night, as we do, um, it's not the same by any stretch of the imagination. So a lot of these games are starting to look and sound the same. And if I were just a, f a general fan, I would feel like, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting bored by this. Um, the bubble was different. It was summertime. It was resuming a season and it was a, each bubble was a theater. The way they had draped the arena, the video screens, the music, the league had it uh, managed and there was a world feed for television. So that was kind of um, created as a show. 
This is city to city, every building's different, but now they're all kind of looking generic to me as you watch games, the colors change, that's it. You know, but you got the superimposed ads all over the place and you've got the seats covered and there's a mascot in an empty arena jumping around like a, like a maniac, you know, that, that's what you see. You know, you guys score and they blow the cannon. I mean, that's, 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 that's what you see. Um, so you get to Lake Tahoe and it looks beautiful. It looks uh, spectacular. I'm interested to see what it sounds like because they're going to enhance yeah. natural sounds. I'm not, I don't think they're going to pipe in crowd noise. They can't, that would be foolish. So, you know, will it be too quiet? Will it be really cool? I think it will, the team are good. It's going to drive the rating. Uh, they'll do a great job of producing it. There's no question about that. And from what I and it is going to be very strict COVID wise. So you get in there, you get to the hotel, the teams and the people that are there and that's it. And then you get out. So I don't think they put anybody at risk. I think it's tough on the East Coast teams. I mean, to think that Boston and Philly played last night, they fly there today, they get a chance, I would imagine, to practice tomorrow. They play Sunday and they get out of there. And then they play early next week. That's difficult. Easier for Colorado and Vegas to get in there and get it done. And then I'm, I'm, I'm you know, a little red flag last night. They changed the start time from three to two for sunlight. Uh, that's interesting. Do we have a problem on the horizon or that no one's talking about till we see what it is? To me, I think so. Why? They've never done that. So I think they got there and they're like, wow, the sun on Sunday could be, we got to move it up for whatever reason. But they're, they're playing at 11 in the morning, these teams. So uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a, a side show for the fans. I think that's the best way to, to do it. I'm glad to hear the players speak. Uh, you know, no one has balked at it yet. So, uh, but Philly's not, Philly's bringing the junior varsity. You got seven regulars mm -hmm. that aren't going to be there, right? So that's that's unfortunate. Yeah, that is unfortunate, and it just drives home the point that none of us can wait until hockey life returns to normal, and we can get back to doing what we do the best, right? Well, the game, any of these sports are, are nothing without fans. Nothing. I mean, we can talk about revenue recapture and the reasons for doing it and giving people at home an outlet. Yeah, but it's been too long. And now we're really seeing, and I think the athletes are gonna appreciate the people more than ever when they come back. And I just think over time, it's natural to take all of that for granted, you know, but now they're gonna understand when these people come back, watch how they play in front of people when the people come back. That's gonna be, the, the two are gonna, the people are gonna go nuts and the teams are gonna be like, man, we're doing this for why we want to do this. And we need it. Even golf, absolutely. And I love golf, but it stinks without the gallery. And it's way different for guys, you know, looking over a five footer for it all with thousands of people standing around than just putting like you and I would if we went out. We'd miss, of course, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same. It's the same thing. We need people. This is just, this is, this is too much. It's got to end soon. Let's hope. Let's pray. I totally agree with you, John. And, uh, and thanks for that. And I know the fans will appreciate that. Everybody thinks it and you know, not oh. many people say it. So, well, um, we, we even, we even drive our craft off the fans, yes. you know, like this is, you know, we're, we're, we're actors now and that's not a good thing. I mean, we do a goal call with 20,000 people. I mean, you're not acting. Yeah. And we need, I know the way I call a game, I need, I like to let the game go a little bit sometimes when the crowd's really going, like in the playoffs, you don't need commentary sometimes. Sometimes you just hear that sound and you let the game breathe. You can't let the game breathe today. There's nobody breathing. So it's, a, it's, we got to get back there. That's it. Yeah. It, but if we're actors, we're not getting paid like the Hollywood actors. We're getting paid oh. like those, you know, people and on Broadway that are waiting tables uh, a couple days yeah. a week. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't have the Screen Guild and all that stuff. No. We have a Broadcasters Association, which uh, that's another podcast. Yeah, we got we got to get the president of that. I Yeah, that's that's another conversation I need to have with yep. you. We got to talk to the president of that association. He's never been impeached, that guy. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> no, it's amazing. Somebody, uh, CNN or one of these states, they should do a story on this. It's a flawless <laughs> record. Flawless. <laughs>
John, thank you so much. It's enjoyable as always. Uh, great to talk to you, and I wish you nothing but the best as you go through the rest of the season. And then, of course, best of luck kicking things off in Seattle with the Kraken. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Good luck. John Forslund is one of the many people in this game that I never tire of talking to. I just love the conversations. Uh, he's so bright. He brings such insight, and he's a fun guy. So when you put that all together, I love talking to him. So thanks to John for being on the show and talking with us today. And tomorrow, the Blue Jackets and the Nashville Predators are going to close out this two-game set. It'll be the middle game of a four-game homestand. The Blackhawks are coming in after Nashville leaves. But again, one game at a time. Torch says that all the time he says that. We just take them one at a time. And the next one is tomorrow, 7 o'clock, against the Predators. Will it be chippy? Will any of the emotion from game one spill over into game two? I told you earlier, I can't wait to see. I can't wait to find out, and I hope it does. I, I've got fingers crossed that it does. I want to see a little old-time hockey. That's what I'm hoping for in the game tomorrow night. Uh, pre-game coverage starts at 6.30 tomorrow, both on Fox Sports Ohio and on the Blue Jackets radio network, which includes a flagship station in Columbus 97.1, The Fan. That's going to do it for today's edition of CBJ and 30 presented by Tell Ohio Credit Union. Once again, thanks to John Forslund of NBC for joining me today. And thanks to you for being here as always. Until next time, I'm Bob McElligot saying so long. 